Hello and welcome to part 13 of Let's Create a 2D Platformer in the Godot Game Engine. My name is Colin, and in this tutorial, not so many series, we're creating this 2D platformer video game. Of course, in this game, you control the player on screen using keys on your keyboard. Of course, you can walk, run, jump, and fall. You can collect coins, jump on enemies and squash them, get hurt by enemies and lose lives. Of course, you can shoot fireballs, do wall jumps, find keys to unlock doors. You know how 2D platformer games work. So in this tutorial, in part 13, we're going to start creating our game level enemies. Our enemies in our game are going to be little blob objects that squish up and down essentially as they walk around. And so this video will be about creating our enemy object, which is going to be a new scene in Godot, which we can then reuse and create instances of in our game level. And then in the next video, in part 14, we'll handle our enemy player collisions. Because when we collide with our character into the enemy from the side, that does something different than if we jump on top of the enemy. So we'll handle that in the next video. In this video, we have quite a bit of programming to do though, because we have an enemy that will fall with gravity and we as the programmer get to decide for each copy of our enemy, if that enemy will fall off the edge of a platform and then maybe fall and land on another ground or, or a different platform, or if that enemy will detect the edge of a cliff and turn around. Likewise, our enemy has to be able to detect a wall. If it detects a wall, it should turn around and move in the opposite direction. So we've got quite a bit to do. But if you have not seen parts 1 to 12 of this mini-series on how to create a 2D platformer in the Godot game engine, I'll put a link to this whole playlist containing all of my Godot 3 tutorials up on the screen right now. Check out that playlist if you haven't seen any of the previous parts of this mini-series. But let's go ahead and jump into the Godot editor. Of course, if you like this video or if you learned something in it, please go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps out me and my channel. And if you want to see more videos like this one in the Godot game engine or in Blender or other technology, Click on that subscribe button as well and click the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. So as our game project stands right now, we have our little character. And as of the last three videos in this mini series, we have coins to collect in our level, including a heads up display that on the screen that stays with the camera displays how many coins you've collected in the game. And of course, if you collect all the coins, in my case, three, you win the game and the game restarts. So let's go ahead and check that out. I'll press the play scene button. Our game level will load and my character falls. I can move around and I can collect coins. And yes, it counts them up here. And if I collect all three, hey, my game restarts. But our game, other than the fact that we can fall into the abyss if we fall off the edge of a platform, well, it doesn't have many obstacles. So let's add some enemies. To add an enemy, of course, we're going to create a new scene. That's how you create new objects that you want to reuse in Godot. So I'm going to press the plus button. Our enemy object is going to be a physics object that we have to program not only gravity in, but also different behaviors like detecting the edge of a cliff and controlling our character's left and right movement to make our enemy walk. So we're going to start off this new empty scene using the physics type of node that our enemy is going to be based on, and that is going to be a kinematic body 2D object. Now, there could be a way of making an enemy out of something like an area 2D. That's the same kind of an object or node as our coins, because our enemy essentially could just detect our player entering that area of the enemy and then our player could get hurt or we would lose the level and restart the level or go to a you lose screen. But in this case, our, our enemy is going to fall with gravity. It needs to be able to detect platforms. It needs to be able to hit our player and it, our player needs to be able to jump on it. So I think a kinematic body 2D is the way to go. So in my empty scene, I'm gonna press the plus button. I'm going to search for, I'll clear my search out. Uh, I'm going to add a kinematic body 2D. So I have got it in my recents here. I can search for kinematic as well. Make sure you're adding the blue 2D one and not the 3D one, of course. So I'll double click on that. That's now my root node of my scene. I'm going to double click on it. I'm going to call it enemy. That makes sense. And of course, to it, I need to get rid of this error, which basically just says we need a collision shape 2D of course. So I'm going to press the plus button and I'm going to add a collision shape 2D, not a collision polygon, a collision shape. 
There we go. Our collision shape is going to be a rectangle. We'll deal with that in a few moments. But first, let's select the root node of our scene one more time. I'm going to press plus. We're going to add a sprite, although our character or our enemy is going to be animated. So we're going to add an animated sprite. So I'll search for anim and then I'll find animated sprite. And of course, it's the blue one. So I'll double click. Now, for our game, we're going to be using another one of the assets that I'm providing to you that I got from www.kenny.nl. They are an amazing resource for game assets, including sprites, 3D models, fonts, sound effects, you name it. They are not a sponsor of this video, but I'm able to provide these sprites for you from them because once you get one of their sprites packs or asset packs, um, you can then use them in your own projects and distribute them for free. They are royalty free. So I'm able to give this folder to you, which is called enemies, and it has three pictures in it. So go ahead and download the zip file of this folder with these three slime blue, slime blue, blue, and slime blue squash. They're all PNG images, which means they have transparent areas. That's what this checkerboard is around the actual little blob enemy. So I'm going to get that enemies folder. I'm going to right click and copy it. I'm going to go into my project, my game project folder, into my assets folder, and I'm going to paste uh, this enemies folder. The assets folder, by the way, is just a folder that I created to keep all of my game assets. That means sprites and fonts and sound files, things like that, all in one place. You don't actually have to have an assets folder. Okay, let's go ahead. I've got that enemies uh, set of images in there. By the way, these enemy or slime blue pictures, they were not all the same size as I got them from Kenny.nl. And so I actually edited them these picture files so that they're all the same size. If I hover over them, you'll see that they're all 57 pixels by 34 pixels. And if they are not all the same size and you try to use them all in an animated sprite, you might find that they might not stay like they're on the ground, that they might move up and down, which doesn't look good. So I've edited them and I'm providing those edited versions to you uh, in the description area below this video on YouTube. So they're in my project folder. If I go into Godot, they'll import really quick. I'm going to select my animated sprite of my enemy. I'm going to go over to the inspector with that animated sprite selected. Of course, it has a frames resource, which we need to create a new sprite frames resource. I could do a resource in, and then I can click on the word sprite frame. It'll open up my sprite frame dock at the bottom in which we have an animation, which I'm going to call uh, crawl. I'll get rid of the default name. And this crawl animation is going to have those two frames of my enemy kind of walking, which means kind of squashing up and down a little bit. So I'll add slime blue and slime blue blue. I'm not sure why they're named like that. So now you can see that if I go through my frames zero and one over here, that's what it's going to do as it's walking. I actually didn't have that walk animation working in my demo game, which you can play online at itch.io, which is in the description area below the link for that game, which you can play this game. We have a crawl animation. I'm going to make one more animation because we need a squashed pose. And so I'll drag my uh, slime blue squashed picture in. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my crawl animation. That should be the default animation to make sure that is the case. My animated sprites property for animation should be set to crawl and I will turn on playing so we can see what it looks like. I think that crawl animation is too fast. So I'm going to go maybe down to two frames per second, maybe three frames per second. Okay. My collision shape, we now need to make match the size of the sprite, but we're going to actually make it a little bit smaller because we want to have this object actually detect our player hitting it from the sides or from the top. So the actual kind of size of the kinematic body is going to be smaller. So I'm going to select my collision shape 2D. I'm going to make a new resource, uh, rectangle shape 2D. And I'll make sure that I can see it. It's now hiding behind the sprite. So I'll drag it right below uh, the animated sprite. And whatever is drawn on the bottom is drawn last, which means it's drawn on top. So now I can see it because it's in front because it's at the bottom. So I'm going to make this uh, rectangle shape not as wide as our enemy. Okay, so it's got some extra room on the sides and not as tall. So if I make this 
too tall, well, I can just move it down. And that's kind of what I want. I want some room on the top and on the side. So that should be good. If you find the animated sprite too distracting, you can turn playing off for now and then switch to whatever frame that you want to see to get an idea. So I'm going to make this a little bit shorter, perhaps, and move it down. And I kind of like that. Make sure that your collision shape doesn't go below the edge of your sprite because your character, your enemy will look like it's floating above the ground. So right about there looks good to me. My enemy needs a script. So I'll select the root node. I'll press the script plus button. Enemy.gd is the name of the script file. That's fine. The template, I'm going to use no comments. And other than that, I'll press create. And I'll get to scripting in just a moment, but I'll just do a control S to save this scene. The scene will be called enemy.tscn. That's fine. It's in my res, which is my project folder. I'll press save. And now I'll go to my level one and I'll go to my 2D workspace so I can see it. And I'm going to add an instance of my enemy into my level. Before I do that, though, I'm going to create a new branch or a new folder, essentially, for my enemies. So I'll select my root node of this scene and I'll press plus. I'm going to add a node 2D. I can clear out my search. Node 2D is right there. This node 2D will just act like a folder, kind of like our folder or our branch called coins here. It just kind of contains all of the coins. Same with enemies. So I'll name this node 2D at enemies. And then with that node selected, I will press the instance scene button, this little link button. This will let me choose a scene to create an instance of. So I'll select enemy and press open. And now I've got a little enemy in my level. I'm going to put the enemy above the ground right about here. And so when I play this level, it will just float there. And it is a kinematic body, which means it is a physics body, which means my character will actually bump into it, uh, which is good, I suppose. My character can also land on it. So first thing we need to do is make our enemy have some gravity and have some left and right movement. So I'm going to go to my enemy script. I might want to go back to my enemy scene just so I know that I'm working on the original. And I'll press the uh, script button to go into its script. What I'm going to do is create the same velocity variable that we created for our character. So if you recall, we created above our ready function a variable called var velocity, and I'm going to make it equal to a new vector 2, and I'm going to put my round brackets because you need to do that. And so now we have a variable that has an x and a y property that can store left and right speed and up and down speed. And of course, we have a function that came with our script called ready. But in order for gravity and velocity to work over time, we need our main game loop, which is a function. I'm going to press enter and backspace to line up my cursor with the beginning of the line. We need a function called func, and then it's underscore physics process delta. That, of course, is built into Godot. It's built into most objects. And when you put that, any code you put in this function will be run 60 times per second. So I'm going to make my velocity dot y increase in value 60 times per second. So I'm going to say velocity dot y uh, plus equals. That's a quick way of saying add to that variable. So we're adding to the y value of our velocity, that means up and down, we're going to add to it, I'm going to say 20. And we can play with that value a little bit later. And this will actually do nothing except for change the value of a variable until we make our enemy move using move and slide. That's the same method that we use on our player to make our player actually move. And move and slide is a method built into kinematic bodies that needs a velocity in it. Okay, so if I save this enemy and then I go back to my level one, I'll let you pause the video if you need that code. But I'm going to, uh, in level one, press the play scene button. And so now our player or our enemy, pardon me, falls down. If I go and move my character down, I should be able to see that at the beginning of my game. Good. Let's go ahead and make our enemy have a direction and have some side to side movement. So I'm going to go back to my enemy scene, go back to my enemy's code. Because my enemy is going to be detecting perhaps uh, the sides of platforms like cliffs, or it might detect a wall when it bumps into it. 
we want to give our enemy a direction and it needs to keep track of what direction it's facing. In other words, is it going left or going right? We're going to use a number for that direction and I'm going to make it be stored in a variable. So up above my ready function, I'm going to make a new variable called direction. And I'm going to be a little bit tricky here. I'm going to call and just think of it this way. My direction for right, if my, if my enemy is moving to the right, is going to be one. And if my enemy is moving to the left on the screen, it's going to be negative one. That's going to help us out later on when we're doing multiplication and making our, our enemy move in one direction or the other. So I'm going to say my enemy is moving uh, left because our little sprite is actually facing. His little eye is over there and we'll make him flip if he's going in the other direction. So back to my script, we have a direction of negative one. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say in my enemy's code, you know, I could do a couple of if statements. I could say if uh, direction is equal to negative one, then velocity dot x is going to be equal to something like uh, negative 50. And then I could say another if like lf. And then I could, I'll be lazy here, copy and paste this right down here. And so I'm saying here, if or otherwise, if direction is equal to one, if my character is facing to the right, then he's going to move 50 or with a velocity of 50 on the x axis. So we could do it this way. And this would work if I were to save this and then go back to my level one and press play scene. Well, now my little enemy is moving to the left. And if I were to change his, uh, my little enemy's a script and say the direction is one. Well, if I go back and play my scene now, my little enemy is going to the right. That would work, but there is a more efficient way. I'll go ahead and change this initial direction back to negative one because my sprite is facing to the left. There is a more efficient way of writing these four lines of code into just one line of code. So I'm going to get rid of that. Instead, I'm going to say velocity dot x is going to equal to, uh, we'll say 50, and then I'm going to multiply that 50 times our direction. And that's why we're using one and negative one, because when you multiply a number by negative one, it will equal its negative equivalent. Okay. So it'll become negative 50, or if the direction is one, it'll just stay at 50. So I'm going to say times, yes, an asterisk is times direction. Okay. That's a little kind of a tricky way of flipping the character's speed. So if my enemy's direction is negative one, then negative one times 50 is negative 50, and that'll be his side to side velocity. So I'll go ahead and press play scene. And now my enemy is moving to the left because direction's negative one. And if I make it one, well, the enemy will move to the right. But I'm going to go ahead and change this back to negative one for the initial direction because of course my enemy is facing to the left. But there's a problem here. If I save my enemy scene and go back to my initial level, and let's say I want to have many enemies in my scene. So I'm going to make this copy or this instance of my enemy called enemy one, and then I'll right click on it and say duplicate. And so now we have an enemy two. And if I move enemy two over, and if I press uh, play scene, well, now I have two enemies and that's great. But you can see if I kept doing this, all of my enemies would be in the same direction at the beginning of the game. And yes, they are stopping because they are physics objects and they are encountering basically a wall of my character. But what if I want to have enemies facing in different directions, like some enemies facing to the left and moving to the left at the beginning of my game and some going to the right? Well, what we can do is we can actually make that property, the direction property, available to us when we select one of the enemy objects, one of the enemy nodes over in its properties in its inspector. What I'm going to do is go back to my enemy scene and my enemy script. What I can do is I can make this direction variable. I can export it. And when you put that keyword export before a variable at the top of your code, 
I'll save it, I'll go back to my level one and go back to my 2D uh, workspace. If I select either one of my enemies, look what happens. I now have that because it's exported, I have that variable accessible to me up here in the inspector. And that means if I select each different enemy, I can change that value per enemy. And that means some enemies can have a direction of one and some can have a direction of negative one and that's okay. And as the programmer, we can then take that and set an initial direction and movement or walking direction for each enemy. But we again have to program that. So just to show you, if I press play scene now, one of the enemies is moving to the right and one of them is moving to the left. But of course, it's not flipping. We'll fix that in just a sec because one of them has a direction of negative one, which I changed in this one to one. Okay, let's go back to our enemy scene and I'll go back to my enemy's code. What we have to handle now is this variable and its initial value based on what we, the programmer and the creator of this game, set in each enemy's direction value box in the Godot editor's interface. So if this direction variable is negative one, we want to leave our animated sprite uh, flipped in the way that it currently is. And if the direction is set to one, we want to flip that sprite, the whole animated sprite around. And because this is not gonna be happening at 60 times per second, we're only talking about the initial direction here, we'll be using this ready function. This ready function again uh, executes whenever you first launch the game in Godot and whatever this asset our enemy and or each copy of the enemy is ready to be in the game. Well, we wanna set its orientation correctly. So I'm gonna say uh, in the ready function, if direction, is equal to a one, and I'll put my little colon at the end of that line. If the direction has been changed to one, we need to flip our little enemy sprite over, and we can access the enemy sprite by using our little dollar sign. So I'll put a shift four on my keyboard, dollar sign, and I'll write uh, the name of the node, which is called animated sprite. We want to access this node and change its flip H property. So this animated sprite has a flip underscore h property. We did this with our character as well. So you should recall that from that previous video, uh, several videos ago. And I'm gonna set its flip uh, h property to true. And I don't believe that we need to worry about uh, looking at if the direction is set to negative one when we first start the game or when the enemy first is in our game because we don't have to do anything to do with flipping when our game first starts if the direction is negative one because the sprite would already be correct. So if I go ahead and save this, if you need to pause the video to get this code for yourself, please pause the video, but I'll go back to my level one and I will press play scene. And so now our little right facing enemy is facing the right direction and so is the left enemy, so we're good. The next thing we're gonna do is make our enemy be able to detect if he hits a wall. In other words, if my enemy gets over to here, if I don't get in the way of my enemy moving, the enemy shouldn't just stop at the wall and keep trying to push through the wall forever. That would be a little bit ridiculous. Uh, so the enemy should actually detect that wall and turn around. If you recall, a kinematic body 2D has a method built into it called is on wall. And so it can detect if that happens. But in order for that to happen, I'll go back to my enemy scene and go back to my enemy's code. We have to tell our enemy which direction is up and down or specifically which direction is uh, up and put that into our move and slide method call. So right here, I'm gonna put a comma because this move and slide has many different parameters that can take, including an up direction. I'm gonna say vector two dot up. And this is a constant that basically defines which way is up. And while we're at it, we might as well make our velocity update based on how our enemy is colliding with the ground. And so I'll put velocity uh, equals move and slide velocity. If you're not sure why I put this here, I explained that way back when we were programming the movement and the gravity of our character in a previous video. So what I need to do now is above these two velocity lines and the order here will matter. So don't just type this next bit uh, below everything else, put it above your velocity dot 
uh, y and x lines, we're going to check to see if we are on a wall. And we know what a wall now is based on which direction is up. And so walls would be 90 degrees perpendicular to uh, the floor direction. So I'm going to say if and then is on wall is a method built into kinematic body 2D objects. This is a method call. So I'm going to put uh, my round brackets and my colon and I'll press enter. And if our enemy detects a wall, what do we want to have happen? Well, we want to switch this direction. So I'm going to say direction uh, is going to be equal to uh, itself times negative one. And this will work. This will actually flip the direction no matter what, because if we tell the direction to equal itself times negative one, well, if the direction is currently one, that means the enemy is moving to the right. Well, one times negative one is negative one. And so the direction will then become negative one. If the direction is already negative one, if our character or the enemy, pardon me, is moving to the left, well, negative one times negative one, a negative times a negative is a positive, and so it'll become positive. So this is a really good uh, method of keeping your code short and flipping the direction of your uh, enemy by using this negative one and one to your advantage. So go ahead and pause the video if you need to, to get this code, but I'm going to do a control S to save, and I'll go back to my level one, and I will press play scene, and so now if our little enemies detect a wall, they should switch into the other direction. But as you can see with this one, it, uh, it didn't flip around. And so I'll go and test that out. I'll go maybe over to this one and catch up with it and make it turn around. Yes, it does actually change direction, but it, uh, it actually bumps into the other one and it's not flipping around. So I'm going to go back to my enemies code and I'm going to say if my character encounters a wall, not only should it flip uh, its direction, but we should also toggle, no matter if it's true or false, this flip H property. Now, I could put a couple of if statements here to say, you know, if the flip H is true, then make it false. Else if or elif, if flip H is the other way, then flip it to the other way. But there is a sneakier one line version of that as well. And that is, I'm going to put a dollar sign and access my animated sprite, just like before, as well as its dot flip uh, underscore H property. And I'm going to make it equal to uh, not itself. So I'm going to say uh, not dollar sign animated sprite dot flip H. And so basically, because this flip H is a true or a false, if I say make it equal to not what it currently is, well, because there are only two options and because, you know, you're just working with true and false, it will flip. If it's not going to be true, then that is essentially logically false and it will make flip H false. If it's already false, well, not false is true. I think you get what I'm getting at here. So that should flip around the sprite. Let's go ahead and test that out. If you need to pause the video, please do, but I will do a control S. I will go back to my level one scene. I'll press play a scene. So now if this one bumps into me, hey, he flips around. And if I go over here, that one flips around. And you know what? If they bump into each other, they will both change directions. If you don't want the enemies to be able to detect other enemies and bump into each other, even if you do, we should think about our enemies' collision layers and collision masks. Let's go ahead and deal with that. We need to deal with that over in our enemy scene. So in the enemy scene, I'm going to select the root node. And of course, we'll go over to collision. We have, of course, collision layers, which assign what layer for collisions each object type is on. If I click these three little dots, I'm going to make sure my enemies are in the enemy layer and I'll uncheck player because enemies are not players and under mask we need to think about what uh, layers or what kinds of other objects our enemies need to be able to detect. Enemies should definitely be able to detect uh, players, yes. Should they detect platforms? Probably yes. Should they detect fall zones? Mm, probably not. Items? No. Other enemies? Well, that depends if you want enemies to bump into one another. If I check that value 
then yes, they will bump into each other. If I don't, they should not. Should they detect fireballs? Yes, they should, at least when we make fireballs. So I think we're good. I will click somewhere else. And if you need to pause the video to get those layers set up, uh, please do. And of course, we're editing this on our original enemy scenes root node, not any individual instance of our enemy that will get things confused. Don't go there, okay? Let's go ahead and do a control S to save. I'll go back to my level one. I want to test that out. I made it so that the enemy would not detect other enemies, right? I left that unchecked. So now hopefully in level one, if I go and I make this one bump into me and change direction, and if I make this enemy bump into me, will they bump into each other? No, they will not. So you can decide uh, that behavior for yourself. Now, I need to bring up a mistake that I made in a previous video. When we set up our collision layers and our collision masks, when we were first creating, I believe it was, our coins, I did not set the collision layer and mask up properly for our one-way platforms. I know that because if I put my little enemy above my little platform and I press the play scene button, uh, no, it actually does work. So our little enemy did fall on this one-way platform and it did just act like normal. That's because each enemy, if I go back to the enemy scene and go to the enemy's root node, um, it is set with a mask to detect the uh, platform. But my mistake in a previous video was still there. If I select the tiles one way, this is my little branch for one way platforms, uh, and I go to its child node, the static body 2D, this is what actually makes your player be able to land uh, on or go through if he's jumping up through the platform. This static body 2D physics object, I did not set the collision layers and mask properly for. So if I click on the first layer, three little dots, I should make sure that this object is a platform and not a player. Okay, that's important. And then it's mask. What should a platform be able to detect? Well, platforms detect players and enemies and fireballs. Uh, platforms do not need to know about fall zones or items or other platforms. Okay, so make sure you fix that if you're following along with me in this whole series. So we are doing pretty well here. Let's talk about cliffs and our enemies falling off the edge of things. Very likely you will want your enemy to not always fall off the edge of a platform. Maybe you want some enemies to be able to detect uh, an edge and then be able to turn around if they see an edge coming up and stay on a platform and maybe some enemies you want to be a little bit less intelligent and fall off cliffs we will set that up right now what i'm going to do is go to my enemy scene we're going to add a new type of node in our project it is called a raycast 2d so i'm going to select my enemy's root node this is in the enemy scene i'm going to press plus and i'm going to search for ray cast all one word there is a 3d version of course we're not going to use that we're going to use the blue 2d version so i'm going to select it and press create a raycast 2d is essentially like a walking stick if the walking stick is pointing in a direction if it can reach something and detect if something is in that space well it'll detect that and you can work with that as the programmer this raycast and raycast by default are not actually enabled that's why this arrow is gray if i select this node and go over to the inspector i can turn on enabled that'll make it blue and so now it'll work what we want to do here is put this raycast 2d which basically sends out a little signal again and again and again in basically something that's one pixel wide even though this arrow is thicker than that and if anything comes into collision with that ray cast like a ray of light it will detect that so what we're going to be doing here is putting this ray cast 2d i need to drag it from its little origin point here you can't drag it uh, from anywhere on it but except for up here we're going to put this ray cast 2d on either side of the enemy depending on which direction the enemy is moving because if the enemy is moving to the left well we don't need to detect cliffs that it's moving away from on its backside essentially we only have to detect cliffs that it's about to reach near its head so i'm going to dynamically change the position of this raycast 2d from being right about here 
to being over here, depending on which direction our enemy is facing. So by default though, we're just gonna set its uh, position. So I'll go to its transform position and set its X value to zero. And I'm gonna change its cast to value because it's going down way too far now. We want it to cast down just below the ground because we want to know if the ground is still there. And if the enemy keeps going and this ray cast 2D no longer detects the floor, well, that means that the character, the enemy should turn around. So I'm going to cast to something like 20, I think. I'm not sure if this ray cast goes to the end of the arrow here or the base of the arrow. I'm not sure. So I think 20 is a good value. So when the enemy first loads into a game level, we're going to use that direction variable to put the ray cast 2D either right there or right there. Let's go ahead and do that. I'll press Control Z to put this back uh, at the origin at zero on the X axis. In my enemy's script, of course, I'm going to be working with this ready function to handle things that need to get set up right when the game first loads. Before we do any coding though, I'm gonna change this name of my Raycast 2D to Floor Checker. That's a more friendly name. And so in my enemy's script, I'm going to say, I'm gonna line my, I'll press enter and line up my cursor with the beginning of this if, so we're not saying this line of code only if direction is equal to one. I'm gonna say dollar sign floor checker, and we're gonna make its initial position. So I'm gonna say dot position, and that's its position property. And I'll put dot X to access its left and right position. And we're going to assign it to the width of the collision shape 2D. So I'm going to be putting this arrow either right at the edge of this collision shape on the left side or on the right side. And we can actually look at the value of the width or really the extents value. That means the distance from the middle of this collision shape out to the edge of it. This is kind of a tricky way of doing things, but it makes our code less dependent on hard coded numbers. So again, we're gonna be using the width or the extent value left and right of this collision shape uh, for our positioning of our floor checker Raycast 2D. So I'm going to say the position, the X position of the floor checker should be equal to the extents of that collision shape 2D. So I'm gonna use my dollar sign again. I'm gonna get my collision shape 2D. We can actually access that extents value from our code here. So the collision shape 2D, we're accessing that object. I'll put a dot and now we need to access its shape property. And now we're gonna access the extents of the shape property. And we do that using a get underscore extents method call and it doesn't know that this exists based on our code because our shape is a rectangle but not all shapes have extents so when you type dot get underscore extents uh it won't prompt you for it okay so all we need to do now is say dot x but we don't know if we should use the negative version of this value or the positive version of this value uh, at least not by default, or it's not gonna be the same all the time, but it will be based on our enemy's direction. And so we're gonna take this value, which might be something like 20 pixels, and we're gonna multiply it by our direction, okay? So basically what this line of code is doing, and I'll let you pause the video now if you need it. It's a bit longer than my screen. Maybe I'll zoom out once so you can get it all in your view right there. What we are doing visually is essentially when our game is loading, I'll go back to my enemy scene here, is when the game first loads, we are putting, based on our enemy's direction, the Raycast 2D, our floor checker, at essentially positive 20 or negative 20, which is based on the extents of uh, this shape object, which if I actually go and select my collision shape and look at its rectangle shape, well, I was pretty close. It was 20.682, but we're actually accessing that value in our code. And we're saying, hey, make it equal to positive 20.682 or negative 20.682, because they're the same on both sides. So I'll go back to my enemy's code in case you need it still. 
but we're actually going to take this line of code that we just typed and copy it. So I'll press control C after I select it and we're going to paste it somewhere else in this code. Uh, and the reason why we're going to do that is because if our enemy detects a cliff and it turns around, well, we need the Raycast 2D, our floor checker to jump from here over to here. And whenever it changes direction, essentially it's gonna do that. So it'll be jumping back and forth. The reason why we're doing it this way and not using two different Raycast 2Ds is because these Raycast objects are actually quite intensive for Godot to run in your game and having too many of them will actually slow down your game. So if we can have one instead of two and therefore half all the Raycasts in our scene, that's a good thing. Okay, so I'll press Control Z to put that back where it was. And I'll go back to my enemy's code. So I copied this line right here uh, and I'll press control C. We're going to say if our player is on the wall, we want to switch our direction. Of course, we want to flip as well our sprite around, but also we're going to flip that uh, floor checker over to the other side when we flip our direction around. So I'll paste control V that code right there. Okay, if you need to pause the video, please do, but I'll do a control S to save and I'll go back to my level one 2D workspace. Let's go ahead and see what happens when I press play. Of course, my enemy should fall and I'm gonna pay a, a special attention to this top enemy right here. What is it gonna do? It's gonna fall off the edge because we haven't programmed our enemy to if it no longer, or that Raycast no longer detects a floor, we have to say if that is no longer detecting to turn the, the enemy around. So back to our enemy scene and back to our enemy's code. We want to flip the enemy's direction and flip the enemy's sprite and flip the position of the floor checker if the floor checker is no longer detecting something that it should be colliding with. In other words, a platform. Now our floor checker, if I actually select it, has a collision mask. We have to tell it what kinds of objects and what layers it should be looking for. In this case, I'll press the three little dots. It should only be looking for platforms. That's all it cares about. So I'll just check that and click somewhere else. But there is a method, and this is the crux of all this ray casting. There is a method called is colliding. And it's something that you can call on a raycast to check to see if it is still colliding with something or detecting something in that area. So we're going to use that right now. I'll go back to my enemy script. We're going to say if the raycast 2D called floor checker is no longer colliding with something, we're going to make it do all of these three lines of code. So I'm going to use an or here because if the enemy detects a wall or if the floor checker is no longer detecting a floor, then flip around. So I'm going to say or, and we're actually going to say not because we're checking to see if the floor checker is no longer colliding with something. So if is on wall or not, and now I'll access our floor checker, dollar sign floor checker dot, and this is the method is underscore colliding. And so I'll press enter uh, right there to complete that line. Because of course this, this Raycast is 60 times per second checking to see if it's colliding with something. And if the enemy is on a floor, then the floor checker is colliding with something. But as soon as it's not colliding with something, that means there's a cliff right where the enemy is heading. And so we should flip our enemy around. And that's what we now have. So if the enemy detects a wall or a cliff, it should flip around. Let's go ahead and see if that works. I will do a control S to save. I will press with level one selected play scene. And now we're watching that top enemy, which just turned around properly as it uh, detected a cliff. Let's watch it on the other side. And hey, it worked. Let's go and watch uh, this other enemy. I will speed this part of the video up. And our enemy uh, detected the cliff properly, and that's great. But we have a problem. Now that we have this floor checker, our enemy is going to change directions if it no longer detects a uh, floor under that raycast. But what happens when the enemy is in midair, like if it's falling at the beginning of our game, like right now when I press the play scene button, it's going to fall down. Or what happens if we turn that 
off if we don't have that behavior if we want a dumb enemy that falls off the edge let's go ahead and watch this enemy as it falls at the beginning of the game i'll press play scene did you see it i'll do it one more time i'll stop and press play scene watch as it falls down the enemy was going back and forth and back and forth as it was falling down and it was doing that because this raycast didn't detect a floor and so it used that code that we just typed i'll go back and look at that code it saw that we were not colliding with something and so it flipped the direction and it kept doing that 60 times per second so we're gonna add an and in here i'm gonna say if our enemy is on a wall or not checking or not colliding with something that is with the floor uh, raycast 2d uh, and we want to make sure we're on the ground in order for that part of it to be true so i'm going to say and is on floor and so these two because we have this and right here that will kind of combine it in a condition or a boolean expression with the not floor checker is colliding so these two things have to be true in order for it all to kind of work together uh, basically now we have two conditions either the enemy is hitting a wall or they have to be uh, on the floor and the floor checker is not colliding those two things work together now okay it's a little bit logically confusing but uh, I think you can probably see what we're getting at here. So I'm going to do a control S to save. I'll go back to level one and press play scene. Now, when that enemy falls, it didn't go back and forth. I'll do that one more time so you can see that that was the case. Okay. But we want some enemies to stay on their platforms and detect cliffs and turn around when they see a cliff. And we want some enemies to be a little bit less smart and just fall off the edge of cliffs. And we want to be able to decide this on a per enemy basis. So what we're going to be doing here is adding one more variable that's going to be an exported variable that's up here. And we're going to call it detects cliffs. And it's going to be an on or off switch. So let's go ahead and add that now to our enemies code. I'll go back to my enemy and go back to my enemy script. We're going to create a variable called, so I'll put var and before var, I will put export to make sure it shows up in the inspector. We're going to call it detects cliffs. And I'm going to make it equal to true by default. And so when you have a variable like this with a true or false value, it is called a Boolean variable, or that's the data type, Boolean. And when you have one of these variables and it's exported and you go and look at the inspector for that kind of an object, you have an on off switch now detects cliffs and it writes it nicely here, even though I have uh, it with no capitals and an underscore it put in my scene um, right here in the inspector, it with capitals and with a nice space. So that's kind of nice. So for each of our enemies, we can decide to uncheck or leave check this detects cliffs. And if we uncheck it, the enemy will be dumb and it'll fall off the edge of cliffs. In order for that to work, if we uncheck this, we wanted to disable that uh, floor checker raycast 2D. So in our code, what I'm going to say is when, of course, we're going to use this function ready here, we're going to say, and I'll go down to my next line here, we're going to access the floor checker. So dollar sign floor checker, and I'm going to turn off its enabled property. In fact, I'll go back to my enemy scene to show you. If I go to my enemy scene and go to the floor checker, it has an enabled property, which we turned on at the beginning of this video. So uh, when this uh, enemy first loads, I'm going to say enabled is going to be equal to and then we're just going to say make it equal to detects cliffs because it'll be the same true or false value so i'm going to say detects cliffs just like that so this will be either true or false and we'll be assigning it to that same on or off so now that we have essentially disabled our floor checker by making this detects cliffs false if we do that on one of our enemies so in fact i'm going to try that out if i go back to my uh, level one scene and actually view my scene in the 2d workspace and go to let's say enemy two which is this one right here and i turn off detects cliffs let's go and see what happens when i press play scene well the enemy just falls down and because it's basically looking for that information from that Raycast 2D. It's not finding it. It's just going to be always flipping around back and forth 60 times per second because, again, because of this uh, if statement where we're saying if is on wall or not floor checker is colliding, this 
it is no longer working the way that we want. We're going to use an and right here. So I'm going to put an extra space right there and make sure you keep these in the same order that I have them. I think that that's important. Uh, we're going to put an extra and here and I'm going to say if uh, detects cliffs is true, which we can just write by saying detects cliffs because that is a true or false value. So I'm going to zoom out once or twice on my code so I can get all of that hopefully in one line on my screen. So now this is colliding will only really play an effect on whether or not our character should change direction and flip around based on if this detects cliffs is true or false. It's a little bit logically tricky because now we have so many ors and ands and a not in there as well. I believe this should work. If you need to pause the video, go ahead and do that. But I will do a control S to save. I'm in my level one, I'll press play scene. And so now our little enemy falls down. It's not confused, but it should also now fall off the edge of the cliff because we have on that enemy too, we have detects cliffs turned off. If I turn it on now for this enemy, if I press play scene and I go back and look at it, let's watch it and see what it does. It uh, detected the cliff, and so it would not fall off the edge. If I go back to enemy one and put him right about there, and he has the text cliffs turned on, and I press play scene, what happens? Well, he uh, detected that edge because uh, we put him right there, and he would have fallen off. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and put him right there and look at this scene again. Let's go back and watch and see what he does. So now they're both detecting the cliffs because they both have detects cliffs turned on. If I turn them off, well, they should both fall off the edge. Let's go ahead and put them both right there and uh, let's go see what they do. That one <laughs> landed on my head. That's fine. We'll deal with that in the next video. And that one fell off the edge as well. So I think it's working pretty well. Uh, what we do not have yet though, of course, is the ability to get hurt by enemies or jump on and squash enemies and do a little bounce when we land on an enemy. We will be covering those things as well as disabling enemies when they go off the edge of the screen so we don't have to run their code when they're somewhere else in our level. We'll deal with all that in the next video. But for the end of this video, I will simply go back to my enemy scene and go back to my enemy script and I'll try to put it up on the screen so you can see it. But that will be it for this video. Of course, if you like this video or if you learned something in it, please go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps out me and my channel. And if you want to see more videos like this one in the Godot game engine or in Blender or other technology, click on that subscribe button as well and click the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. Check out my Facebook page and my Instagram page. In those two places, I post sneak peeks and previews of what I'm working on next. That's where I communicate with you guys the most. But that'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.